Hello everybody and welcome to day three of our Peace of Mind Parenting Sleep Seminar. Today we are going to be talking about the all so pesky sleep regression. So on day one, little recap, we talked about sleep physiology and understanding why children refuse to sleep despite the fact that they need to sleep more than anybody else. And then yesterday we talked about that awesome, awesome cycle of overtiredness. We talked about wake windows and schedules and routines and how all of these tips and tricks and generalized plans and blogs and YouTube videos are super well-intentioned for the most part, but have very limited um, helpfulness, right? Because everything has to be customized, even in terms of wake windows. Today, we're talking about something that is a little bit more general. Information that remains relatively stable from one child to another. Somewhat. There's still some customization here. But we're going to talk about those pesky, pesky sleep progressions. Now, if you have a child and you have internet, which I'm assuming you have both if you're on this live. If you are here and you are not expecting or have a child, it's creepy. Please exit the group. Otherwise, for the rest of us, if you have a child and you have internet, you've heard about sleep regressions. I mean, who here has heard about sleep regressions? I would assume every single one of you, if you have a baby and you've spent any time in a mom Facebook group, you have read any article, any book, or watched YouTube videos about, you know, expecting or a baby, or you have Googled at three in the morning how to make my baby sleep, you've encountered the term sleep regressions. And also leaps, right? Leaps or uh, what they call them, leap wonder weeks and whatnot, okay? Now, if you have an app, on your phone that is supposed to help you help your baby sleep who has one of those apps that tells them pretty much every single week especially with newborns that the reason their newborn is not sleeping is because they're in a wonder week now according to these apps your child is in a wonder week all the time so basically they don't really offer much help what they do say is your child's in a wonder week your child is teething your child's in the wonder week, your child's teething, your child's in a sleep regression, your child's teething. And so basically all it does is serve you excuses as to why it's not actually helpful for you. And then if you have the notifications on, it just dings at you throughout the day to say, your baby should be napping. And you're like, baby, phone, baby. Okay. Well, can you tell the baby? Because it's not the baby doesn't seem to be getting the message and there's no point in you telling me that the baby needs to be sleeping because I've been telling him, but he, you know, doesn't want to. So if you have one of those apps, I'm going to tell you to do exactly like the smart lady did and get rid of it. Because as much as they are well-intentioned and as much as the goal is, you know, to, to help parents, you know, achieve better sleep, the reality is that we now know that wake windows are different from one child to another. And it depends on how long they nap for. It depends on how much they slept during the night. It depends on their frequency and length and quality of nap. So a stable, unchangeable wake window doesn't really exist. So that kind of like, you know, destroys the usefulness of a nap. But also, they're just full of excuses, right? It's it's a wonder week and your baby's teething. So first and foremost, let's start by talking about those wonder weeks, okay? Is it really true that your baby is in a wonder week or in a regression for basically the first six months of their lives? And I want to reassure all of the ex expecting moms that no, your baby is not going to be in a wonder week every five seconds explaining terrible, terrible sleep. There are brief moments in the first three months where your baby will be literally physically growing at a really rapid rate and might just eat more. 
And usually that'll be between 6.30 and 10 p.m., which we tend to call those witching hours, okay? So let me like backtrack. And don't worry for all the older kids, we're gonna get to the sleep regressions, but let's start with our newborns, okay? So when your baby is born, his stomach is the size of a green pea. It is ridiculously small. And as a result, they have to eat very often because, well, it's really small. So you can't pack in a whole lot of milk in there. And so it gets digested relatively quickly and then your baby's hungry again. So that is why babies eat so frequently uh, and they tend to snack quite a bit, okay? Now, if you're breastfeeding, your milk at first is gonna be yellow, right? It's colostrum and it's gonna come out in very small quantities, which is totally normal because all your baby can take in is a few drops at a time. And so it is a, like a very rich, very fatty, high protein, very consistent milk, okay? And the usefulness of it being like that is it can tide over your baby a little bit longer. Uh, and that, again, is normal. Now, because they're taking such a small amount at first, it is also normal that they might lose up to 10% of their weight after birth. And then within three to five, six days, if you're a first time mom, that milk is going to start turning white, right? And start looking more like milk, milk, right? And your baby is going to start taking slightly larger quantities, right? Um, their poop is going to change colors and become that typical like Dijon mustard green that it should be that has that very particular smell, right? And your baby will start regaining his weight of birth. Now, if I remember well, by two weeks or so, we ideally want a baby to be back to his birth weight, okay? Now, a lot of moms, when they see that they have just a few drops, right, of that colostrum milk, they freak out, they panic, they think they are not producing enough milk, and then we snowball into the destruction of your possibility of journeying into breastfeeding, okay? Now, that's a whole different story, but that should explain why babies eat so much. So whether a baby is breastfed or formula fed, are they supposed to eat at a very particular preset stable schedule? Like every three hours, for example, should your baby be drinking every two or three hours very, very consistently, consistently and on the dot? Gonna wait for those answers, ladies. Okay. Remember. So somebody says nope. Anybody else want to add into that? The answer is indeed no. There is no such thing as a feeding schedule for a baby. Whether he or she be breastfeeding or whether he be on bottle fed baby. In fact, we once had a mom get mad at me um, because she had a newborn and she worked from home and she wanted her baby to only feed via the bottle at very specific times throughout the day at that time and that time and that time and that time because it was more convenient for her work schedule. And I had to explain. We can't do that. Babies will be hungry when they're hungry. <laughs> you can't make them be hungry at certain times. So those are just guidelines. And I would even, if you have a newborn, I would say just forget the guidelines. Feed on demand. For a breastfed baby, your breast is both the refrigerator as well as their pacifier. Basically, here's how we deal with breastfeeding every baby. When in doubt, stick a nipple out, okay? Your baby's opening his mouth and rooting, stick a nipple out. Your baby cries, stick a nipple out. Your baby is grabbing at things, stick a nipple out. Your baby is making sounds, stick a nipple out. Your baby seems happy, stick a nipple out. You're not sure, stick a nipple out. Just when in doubt, stick a nipple out. And when you are bottle feeding, if your baby is putting, you know, hands in his mouth, rooting, or just seeming to become uncomfortable, or even is starting to like stretch or 
uh, yawn, right? Showing signs that might be time to go to, to sleep soon. Get that bottle ready because remember, feeding to sleep is fine. So there is no set schedule to feeding. Now, what happens with those wonder weeks is there are specific times in the first three months where they go through, they, they grow physically like faster, right? They're always growing quickly, but they, they have these periods where they grow a little bit faster. Now it happens usually, and this is around, right? It's not like set in stone. At the three day mark, at the 10 day mark, I believe then it's at the three week mark and then the 12 week mark. So three months. Okay. Now this is where you'll typically see witching hours, right? Where at around 6 PM, your baby just get very agitated and he wants to snack on the bottle or on the breast, basically on and off for three to four hours. And moms are like, what am I doing wrong? Am I not producing enough milk? Is that what's going on? No, it's totally normal. It is the witching hour and they're just snacking on and off. So what we do at Be Baby with newborns and as a mother of five, it's my favorite thing in the whole world. And it's why I love the newborn phase versus hate it is when I have a newborn baby and six or 530 rolls around, I get into the most comfiest of pajamas, assuming my husband is home, right? And I sit my butt down on a couch very comfortably and I put my nursing pillow around me or prepare a bottle and we will just hold and cuddle and feed on and off and burp and feed on and off and snooze and wake up and feed on and off until 9 30 or whatever time he's or she is actually knocked out for good and ready to go to sleep and we call that that bee baby mommy baby date and we encourage you to get a glass of wine now, put on a really good show, and have your husband serve you dinner and enjoy. There's really no need when you have a newborn to feel like you have to go lock yourself up in a dark nursery, going back and forth in a rocking chair for three to four hours panicking because it's taking three to four hours for your baby to fall asleep for the night. It is normal. And we call them. Be baby, mommy, and baby dates because they are one of the most calming and relaxing times that you will have with your newborn. And those moments pass so quickly. If anybody has a bigger baby now who, you know, they don't last in your arms that much because they're wiggly and they want to go walk and they want to go do all the things and they have FOMO. That newborn phase is precious. So don't stress yourself out. Don't lock yourself in a nursery. You really don't need to, okay? Just dim the lights. And yes, you can. Now you didn't click on the button, so I can't see your name, but on the button in the text above, right? To release your name. But yes, you can absolutely drink while, while breastfeeding. So the rule about wine or alcohol in general with breastfeeding is simple. I'm getting off topic, but you know how I am. Uh, is if you can drive, you can breastfeed. If you can't drive, you can't breastfeed. So in order for alcohol to actually end up in your breast milk, you would have to be so inebriated that you would be in an alcohol coma on the ground. So there's no danger of milk being, of alcohol really, you know, being transmitted into your breast milk. The danger is that you fall asleep while breastfeeding your baby and end up in an unsafe sleeping position. That's the problem with it. So the rule is if you can drive, you can breastfeed. If you can't drive, you can't breastfeed. And no, do not pump and dump. Girl, that is liquid gold. You bottle it up and you freeze it, okay? <laughs> you never, never pump and dump. But if you are able to drive, like if you've had one or two glasses of wine, you can breastfeed. It's perfectly fine. The issue you want to be conscious of is if you are absolutely exhausted and you've had a glass of wine or two and you just feel like you're not super duper duper alert, then maybe have, you know, your husband sit with you and make sure you don't fall asleep while breastfeeding. That's really where, you know, the danger per se comes from. But all that to say, witching hours, right? That's what those wonder leaps really are. They're moments where your baby is just going to feed more and more and more and more often. Okay. 
and it during those brief periods of time and it's totally fine now it is possible that during those moments your baby might have brief moments where he or she seems um unsatisfiable so you've given him or her milk on and off you're cuddling you're doing all the things and then all of a sudden they're just like upset and they're upset no matter what you do right they they during those witching hours in those moments all you need to do is the five s's of dr card easiest trick you can find it on youtube i am not the inventor of it but during witching hours if you're doing the mommy baby date and for whatever reason your baby gets super aggravated the five s's of dr carp k-a-r-p easy fix and then you go back to what you're doing okay perfectly fine now when we're talking about actual sleep regressions we're talking about something completely different and what are sleep regressions well sleep regressions are actually associated to developmental leaps in milestone so remember when we spoke about on day one when your child is learning something new new neural networks have to be created inside of their brain in order for that information to be more easily accessible so an example would be when you get up and walk you're not thinking about the position of your big toe or in what particular angle your feet should march you know in front of the other or where you should put your arms right you're not thinking about any of that because you have perfected the art of walking some of us have some of us haven't but most of us have perfected somewhat the art of walking right and we have built neural networks inside of our brain so that instead of having to think about all this every time we walk it's like it's pre-programmed it's automated it's like go 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 right you don't think and make decisions about everything all day you have neural networks to make that information more easily accessible but when you're learning it the first time so when a child is learning to walk the first time it's when you think about it it's it's kind of a complicated skill right the first time you get off a chair if you don't know how to do it you could just you know get your forehead all the way down and, and hit the ground and then curl over right because you don't know how to do it right and you've probably seen your baby the first time he got off a chair actually legitimately do that little front whirl right so when do we build new neural ne networks in deep sleep so remember we were talking about those sleep cycles right on day one in that portion of deep sleep is when those new neural networks are created so if your baby is learning a super complicated skill like walking right which involves a lot of things simultaneously there's going to be a lot of brain activity in deep sleep because we're building a lot of neural networks right that can cause sleep disturbances and that is what an actual sleep regression is. Now, that being said, is the four month sleep change, so starting to sleep in cycles, a sleep regression? Whoever answers this right will get a free sleep Bible, which is literally a jacked up version of your workbook with all the answers okay okay i'm sorry kaija is it kaija or kaija first or second you are the winner of the sleep bible no it is not a sleep regression why it's not a temporary change it is a permanent change in the rate that your baby sleeps because he starts sleeping in sleep cycles right it is not temporary it's permanent and it's not associated to a big developmental leap it's a progression so here at b baby we call them sleep progressions or developmental progressions when a baby is going through that four month sleep change think of casual ca casual kitchen i i'm french so even casual kitchen or asia with a k we're going to talk on the phone soon and you're going to 
make sure I say that right. I, there's nothing that concerns me more in life than thinking I might be mispronouncing Kasia. Kasia? Is that it? Did I say it right? It's beautiful. Okay. Yay. I like the way it's, I did not like the first way I said it. Kasia. Beautiful. Moving on. Okay. So four months sleep regression, not a, a regression, a progression. Exactly. Now there are actual sleep regressions. When do they happen? At around nine months, at around 12 months, and at around 18 months, and somewhere between two and two and a half years old. And we're going to go through each one, one by one. But first of all, what about six months old? Haven't you heard, Samantha, that there are some like sleep disturbances at six months? Yes. But it has nothing to do with the sleep regression. It has to do with what happens at six months. What are you doing at six months with your baby that is new? And that could potentially cause some sleep problems. Another sleep Bible is on the... So, Petra, we have Kaja that has a sleep Bible. And the next person who answers my question, what happens at six... There we go. Feeding solids. Exactly. So you should be starting solids at around six months. Now, here's the issue. Food, solids, a lot more complicated to digest than just milk. That can cause some belly issues and that can temporarily disturb sleep. It is not a sleep progression. It's just GI, right? Gassiness and really hard poops that are suddenly passing through your, your intestines can, you know, throw you off for a hot minute, okay? So it's not a sleep progression. It's a, you know, a new introduction of food that can kind of cause a little bit of, you know, belly discomfort. And that is what's causing a little bit of that disturbance, right? Now, when I say that actual sleep progressions at 9, 12 months, 18 months, and two and a half years old are at around nine months, I literally mean alrededor, around, because the thing is, a sleep progression is caused by a developmental change. Do all babies learn to walk on the dot at 12 months? No. It's around that age. It can happen at 11 months. It can happen at 13 months. One of my sons, you know, started walking at 13 months, didn't perfect it until 18. Well, he knew how. He just thought he didn't know how. So as long as he was holding something in his hand, he would walk. And then if he dropped the object, he would sit. Right? But the point is, every child goes through very uh, different moments for their development. My fifth is barely 10 months old and started walking. Right? They all go through developmental leaps at different moments. And thus, the sleep progression is around that age. So the nine month sleep progression truly could happen at seven and a half, eight months, nine months, 10 months. Now, what happens around nine months that tends to cause that sleep progression? Well, there's actually a lot of things that happen around nine months. First of all, your little dude who started eating solids at six months, but you know, wasn't super good at holding in and munching in and he didn't have a whole lot of teeth, now can actually munch down. So he's starting to eat more and more and more solid. So that in itself can cause a little bit of belly aches. Usually they have learned to sit and they might be learning to crawl. And on top of that, but probably the worst part is separation anxiety spikes at nine months. Why? they get or they develop object permanence at nine months. Now, what does that mean? Well, before the age of nine months, if you were holding a toy in front of your baby and then you went like this and you went, ah, your baby would be like, oh my God, wow, magic, the object is gone. Now, if you do the same thing to a nine month old, he's gonna be like, nice try mom. And he's going to go behind your back to go get the toy, right? He develops object permanence. So he basically understands that an object can be displaced, that even if he doesn't see the object, it still exists and it's God, right? It means peekaboo becomes a very fun game. 
because then they just rip your hands off your face and they're like, ah, right? Whereas before when you did pick a boo, they were like, oh my God, my mom is like, she performs magic. But at nine months, they're like, I can do it too. Ah, pick a boo, right? They understand object permanence, which is great. However, <laughs> it causes a little bit of a problem. They now realize that you, mom, are a separate physical entity to them. And thus, you can leave. Now, before that, they thought that, that you and him or you and her were kind of like two peas in a pod. You could not be separated, right? You were like marching together always. There was just no doubt in your baby's mind that you could go away. Now they might've cried because they weren't touching you, but they didn't have the realization that you could leave. Now when object permanence comes along, they're like, well, hold on a minute. She can leave. And now all of a sudden, if you close the bedroom door when it's bedtime, you might as well be on the other side of the planet. You have disappeared. You have left. And so now they're crying in there, but they're in full blown panic because they legitimately think that you, mom, have disappeared. And that is where that separation anxiety comes from. So now you, you can't go pee alone. You can't go to the bathroom and close the door. It's going to cause a panic. You have to sit on the floor next to them while they're playing. They have to be very physically close because, again, I realize that you can leave. I don't like it. So you're going to sit right here next to me all the time, right? Thank you. And they don't like that. So what we have to teach them in order to get over that hump is that even though they may not visually see you in a given moment, you're still there. So, for example, we literally want your babies to think, okay, that when you put them to bed and you close that door, that you are standing outside of their bedroom door like a robot plugged into the wall, you know, just making sure you're getting more energy, but waiting for them to call for you if something happens, if they have a nightmare or there's a poop going through their intestine, it's uncomfortable, or something happens and they need you. You're just, you're literally right there, plugged into the wall outside of their bedroom door, waiting to save them like a superhero, okay? That's what we need your baby to understand at nine months so that they don't panic every single time you're out of their view. This is why much of dealing with separation anxiety actually has to be done during the day. So specific activities that are progressional that we have moms do with their babies to basically teach baby that mom can literally walk out of the room, go into another room to pee, right? And she will come back and she's still very close. So if he calls out, she'll come back. Like she's not actually gone. She just went to pee, that is all, and she shall return. So that is really what that separation anxiety is. Now add on top of it, learning how to crawl and the new neural networks and a little bit of problem with deep sleep and causes a few wake-ups and what have you. But a lot of the issues around nine months will also have to do with going to sleep at bedtime because they, you close the door and they freak out, right? Now, the 12 months sleep progression, quite simple. They're learning to walk. And that, well, that's super complicated, right? If we had an exercise when I was in third, third grade and we were learning how to write well, and our teacher told us, I need you to write an instruction, instruction manual on how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich for an alien. And you're making the assumption that this alien does not know what a knife is, does not know what bread is, you know, does not know what spreading means, et cetera. And you really have to like explain everything in great detail. Now you can imagine that the instructions to my alien on how to make a peanut butter, you know, and jelly sandwich were quite extensive. Those are all neural networks that would have to be created in my alien, right? Now imagine the amount of coded lines of instructions that are involved in learning to do something as complicated as walking. Immensely complicated. So what do we tend to see at 12 months in terms of that sleep regression? 
waking up at absurd hours, like waking up at four, five in the morning and not, not for a wake up and a feed and a fall back to sleep. I mean, like, wake up. They are ready to go for the day. It's like 4.30. The sun is far, far away. It's the middle of the night. And they're like, all right, let's go. Let's do it, right? They start waking up at really odd times during the day. They can fight bedtime and have a few wake-ups at night. And most of the time, they are going to fight one or both naps. Now, the biggest mistake that you can do is to think, well, he's fighting naps. He's waking up really early. It must be time to transition to one nap. It's not. Your baby is not yet ready to transition to one nap. In fact, if you do so, although that one nap may be a good nap, it will cause your baby to be overtired and might actually cause that morning wake up to get worse. Okay? What you want to do when you see this happening, cut the morning nap to 30 minutes. Okay, so still have a morning nap, but make it only 30 minutes. So basically what we would call a power nap so that your child can get to the midday nap around 1230 or one and have a decent nap at that point and last until bedtime. During that transition, if your baby needs an earlier bedtime, like 630, that's okay. It's temporary. They are learning how to walk. They are also accumulating a lot of uh, vocabulary in terms of understanding more than what they can say. There's a lot of activity going. It is very demanding for them. You can imagine that practicing to walk kind of requires a lot of energy too. They might need that extra nighttime sleep while we're also decreasing the amount of naps. Okay, so if they need to go to bed earlier, that's perfectly fine. Now, the thing with a 12-month sleep progression is it is long. It lasts on average six weeks. Again, you're not going to learn to walk, you know, perfectly from day one. Have you seen a new baby walk? It's like this wobbly little cute little thing where they fall on their hands and they get back up and they fall on their hands. and they, You know, it takes a hot minute, right? So it is a long sleep progression. So and once you have fixed the naps, once you have, you know, tailored their schedule, and if they are waking up in the night, you are responding with an intervention that helps them fall back to sleep, but that is of lower importance to the brain than, let's say, food or sleep, right? And you've dealt with the separation anxiety of before, then you have to give it a little bit of time. Okay? It'll take a hot minute. That's the longest one. The nine month sleep regression. And once you start doing those exercises during the day and you have those interventions at night, a few days, usually. Like if your baby has been sleep educated prior and is sleeping great before that regression, you'll notice one or two wake-ups for like a day or two, maybe three. And that's it. That will be the full extent of your regression. That's it. And then you're done. 12 months, sometimes it's a little bit longer. Personally, as a mom, it's the one that I hate the most. Because my babies tend to do the early wake up thing. That's their thing. And they fight naps a little bit for a few weeks and then they stop. 18 months. Any idea what might be causing a sleep regression at 18 months? Anybody have a toddler? How long is four months? The four month is not a sleep regression, it is a permanent change in the way that a baby sleeps. So it is forever. <laughs> Um, the molars at four months, very common between 12 and, and 18 months is when the molars tend to begin, but it's mostly language at 18 months. Your baby suddenly has more. No, don't cry. Go back to session one. We, we talk extensively about that. Okay. Uh, jumping up and down, learning to uh, climb things and a whole lot of language. So until then, they probably have said a few simple words, but they have been accumulating a lot of vocabulary. They've been packing it in, right? And then they may suddenly actually start speaking or they start understanding a lot more complex uh, sentences on your part. That is the cause of a sleep regression at 18 months. Now, that being said, 
If your baby has been sleep educated by B baby, there is a very, very, very strong chance that you won't even notice the 18 month sleep change. It'll just kind of like, you won't notice much of a difference. The only thing you might notice when it happens is now it's time to actually drop to one nap. Now with us, because our babies love sleep, because we've sleep educated them, uh, it can sometimes be too much. Sometimes it can take until about two years of age before they actually drop to one nap because they actually like they have a positive relationship with sleep. Right. So um, a lot of them will keep two naps for longer. But usually around that time, that's what you're going to see is they're ready to actually drop to one nap. And if they've been sleep educated by the baby, again, there's a big chance that you won't notice it uh, at all. Or you're going to see one wake up once and you're going to see that your toddler sit up in bed, look outside, be like, oh, it's still dark. And then lay back down and fall back asleep. Right. We had a mom. Uh, post yesterday, she has a three month old, I believe that we just sleep educated. So baby wakes up once per night, every few nights, just once per night, every few nights for a feed. Um, and yesterday she happened to be watching the monitor and she actually saw her three month old sort of wake up, look and go like, Oh, it's still totally dark. It's time to go back to sleep and just go back to sleep. Right. They have a good relationship with sleep. They're like, Oh, it's dark. Yes. I can sleep some more, right? It's completely different. Three-year-old is not too old to sleep educate at all. In fact, I love, 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 love to sleep educate toddlers personally. Every consultant has, you know, their favorite types of things that they like to do. We can do it all. I personally really like doing toddlers um, or preschoolers, in fact, because you can engage them. You can really make them part of the plan, right? And I love the feisty ones, you know, that really like have attitude. Uh, it's not great for the parents. It's great for me as a sleep consultant. It's actually super fun. Okay. It's very, very fun. And, um, it's super quick. We had one toddler, her mom had hired, I kid you not eight to nine sleep consultants. Um, at this point they were this close to divorce and they said, well, this is this is the last resort. Like we do this or we end up splitting because we're, we hate each other at this point. We haven't slept in forever. Um, and I believe it took us three days and we had her sleeping through the night and we actually figured out and diagnosed what, um, health problem she had that was causing a whole bunch of kidney issues. Uh, Jen, my daughter was two and a half years old when B baby sleep educated her. I had struggled for two and a half years and they had her sleeping in less than seven days. See, seven days, not bad, right? You're not my best number, but you're not bad. <laughs> we can go all the way until 12. Exactly. I will do above 12 years old if somebody asks me, but because we haven't done a lot of them, I can't give a guarantee. Like I can't say for sure how quick it's going to work or it depends on a few factors because at that point they're teenagers, they're struggling with sleep. It could be, it's, it's something else, right? So if you ask me for a 13 year old, I'll, I'll ask you a whole bunch of questions so that I can understand a little bit more what's going on and maybe get my brain going and, and try and see what it might be. And we'll have a discussion about that. But until 12 years old, absolutely. Okay, so we sleep educate at four, five, six, seven, all the time. There's no problem at all. So that's the 18 month sleep regression. It has to do a lot with vocabulary. And again, if your child has been sleep educated by us, you're probably not going to notice it. Now, there is one last one between two and two and a half years old. And it has to do at that point with them basically starting to learn extremely complex concepts at two and two and a half years old your children start understanding social concepts they start understanding even like the basics of math what is more what it what is less um their language comprehension basically skyrockets they may start speaking in short sentences 
uh, they're no longer just walking and climbing on the couch. They're literally, you know, climbing up the tree and jumping off of them. They, they just go crazy. I have four boys and one girl. At around that age, my house basically becomes an indoor gym for my toddlers, especially the boys. And it can cause a little bit of an issue, particularly with the crib. So that's why we say two to two and a half years old. So you'll notice that's kind of like the biggest gap we've spoken about, right? It's a six month gap and it's time to move them to a toddler bed, which is what we did simultaneously for Jen's uh, daughter. Now, usually when a parent comes to us with a two and a half year old who wakes up six, seven times a night and we tell them we're going to put her in a toddler bed, they're like, you've lost your mind. I can barely get her to sleep while she's in her crib. And now you want me to remove the gates. You want me to give her freedom. You want me to allow her to be able to climb out of that bed and open doors and leave her room like this. It's going to be a nightmare. And it's not. Transitioning into a toddler bed is so easy to me. Like it's just no stress at all. Okay. There is a particular way to do it that just works in an instant. Now, we have a system that we use that teaches your your toddler how to sleep in a toddler bed, but also not to get out of their bed or their room, depending on what your decision is, until a parent comes to get them. Because we do not want toddlers just walking around your house and making themselves bowls of cereal or, you know, a cup of coffee in the morning, right? We want to keep them safe want them to wake up in their room and call out to you and say, hey, I'm awake. Can somebody, you know, come and get me until they are of a certain age where they can get up and have a glass of water and play with some toys, right? So the one thing that I will add here is a common mistake that I see in parent group, but also in even among sleep consultant is this pervasive, dangerous idea of trying to keep toddlers in their cribs longer than necessary because they don't know how to transition to toddler beds well. It is dangerous. The thing is, the minute that your toddler has figured out that they could climb over their crib or climb into it, the minute they try, the minute they have the idea of like, I don't like these bars anymore, and that's why they're waking up and crying. The minute that happens, it is like a matter of time before they throw their leg over the side of that crib. And if they fall, they could hit their heads on the floor. It is dangerous. Yes, you will see sleep consultants telling parents to remove the frames underneath cribs and to drop mattresses on the floor. The cribs were not intended to be made like that. There have been injuries. That's not what your crib is made for. In fact, it comes with a toddler rail for that moment. You will see sleep consultants and parents recommending that you buy these weird dome tents that you tie on top of a crib. Your kid has decided that the bars on his crib feel like a prison. It's no longer a safe place to them. That is why they're having the idea of climbing out of the crib. Putting a dome over them like a closed aquarium is not going to help the sleep problems. You know, if you're lucky and it actually keeps your toddler in there, which I have many doubts about, they're still not going to be very happy with it, right? And at some point, they're going to be like, oh, hold on. How is she tying this? Aha, okay, let me untie it, right? Do not try and trap your children inside of their crib like an aquarium, okay? If you're fearful about transferring to a toddler bed, just give us a call. We will make a toddler plan with you. It is no big deal. It's actually fun. And we make it a whole thing, okay? We, like, you get them to choose their bed cover. You get them to choose, you know, their first pillow. You get them to, you know, change their room a little bit, right, for a few dollars into something cool. I will go as far as to get the brown paper from the dollar store and tape it to their um, door frames and have them burst through it to, like, unveil their big kid bed. It doesn't have to be complicated. My favorite way, in fact, is to just drop a mattress on the floor. If you have an extra queen mattress, put it sideways because they're not very long, but they roll. 
right? So they don't need the full length, but if you can give them more width, it's great because then you don't have to put a gate or anything. They can just roll around the mattress and you put a little carpet on each end so that they're not, you know, going from the mattress to the floor. My favorite way to do it. Uh, or you can use a little toddler bed or you can use a Montessori bed, which is a very similar concept. It does not need to be very, very complicated. Just be mindful not to take a bed that is on a frame and press it against the wall because you can end up with a space between the wall and the mattress where a child could slip, right? So you don't want that. But don't be afraid of transferring them to a toddler bed. Now, what is the solution to the two-year-old sleep regression? You have to transition them to a toddler bed. That's it. That's really where it's at. You have no choice. Now, here's the thing with sleep regressions, and this is the trickiest part. Let's say that Lynn has a two and a half year old, and at about four months, Cruz, her baby, um, went through the four month sleep change and started waking up every sleep cycle. It just happened. She, it just was the way that he adjusted, but she never consulted a sleep consultant. Um, she tried a few things, but it didn't help. So he basically made it a habit to wake up every 90 minutes, so every hour and a half. And it didn't stop because it's not a sleep regression. It's not a temporary thing, right? It's just, it is what it is. And then eventually Cruz hit the nine month sleep regression. He got a lot of separation anxiety. And now at bedtime, he panicked. And so Lynn had to start basically holding and rocking and doing all the things for about two hours to actually get him to sleep. Um, but then after his first wake up, she would bring him in bed with her because the minute he didn't see her, he panicked. So they ended up co-sleeping. Now, that wasn't resolved either, right? She never consulted. So at that point, it just sort of sandwiched, right? We had the four-month sleep change and now the nine-month sleep change. Then the 12-month sleep regression rolled around. And at that point, he started fighting naps uh, and he started waking up, even though he was co-sleeping at five in the morning and not going back to sleep. She didn't know how to fix it. So even though... He learned how to walk and the sleep regression stopped. The morning wake up remained. So now we have waking every 90 minutes, co-sleeping, and waking up at five in the morning. And then he turned two, two and a half years old, and he's wanting that independence, but not totally ready for that independence. So now when she tries to bring him in bed with her to co-sleep, he's even fighting that. What do we call that? We call that compounded sleep regressions. It's when a sleep regression has elapsed, it's done. However, the consequences of the sleep regression have not. And then another sleep regression comes along and the impacts of those basically add themselves and those are not, you know, fixed, if you will. And the, they, they remain even though the sleep regression is gone. And then the next sleep regression arrives and it causes additional problems and it compounds. And then you basically end up with a sandwich or a braid of sleep problems or sleep disruptors. So you have a 10 month old and your 10 month old has some sleep problems and you tell your friends and your friends who had babies who slept great through the night tell you, it's just because you're going in his room too quickly. Or this famous Instagram person tells you, you just need to put him to bed earlier, that's all. Or you need to follow you know, these simple wake windows. They're giving you tips and tricks and what have you and nothing works. You have like a minestrone soup of sleep disruptors. No wonder it's not working. No wonder you're finding yourself frustrated and confused and overwhelmed and lost. You're trying to fix something that is a mess, right? It's a mess. It's like if your motor is broken, but there's like 12 things broken inside of the motor, you're going you're gonna to struggle using YouTube to try and figure that one out, right? You're going to have to call a mechanic. You're going to be like, look, this is, this is complicated. It's not working. But here's the thing. 
when it comes to your children, you shouldn't even be, you know, trying it. You shouldn't be going with the flow. You shouldn't be testing on your kids, right? You shouldn't be trying a hundred different tips and tricks to see which one sticks. This is a person, right? This is a child. So every time somebody gives you a tip and trick and you're like, okay, I'll try it. Then you go to try it, but then you have that sudden intense fear, doubt. Is this even going to work? Is this going to cause more problems? Is this going to make her think that I, I, I'm, I'm not there for her? Is this going to cause her to be more attached? Is this, which is not a thing, by the way, your children should be as attached as attached possible. Is this going to actually make her sleep worse, right? And so you can't really implement it because if you're not sure that it's actually going to work, you don't want to test it on your baby, right? You, you kind of want to know for a fact that this is the right thing to do. So you don't do it. And even if you do, you force yourself, you do it. Somebody told you, you got to do it. Your husband told you, you're like, come on, Kayla, just be reasonable and just do it. And then you do it and it doesn't work. And now you're traumatized. There's the three C's of sleep education success that we believe are absolutely necessary. The first step is customization. Making sure that the plan that you're using is not just odd tips and tricks. It's, we diagnose, we figure out what's going on, and we make a plan for you. It's customized. Why? That gives you certainty. Certainty. You know for a fact that what you are doing is going to work. You know for a fact that it is safe. You know for a fact that it is healthy. You know for a fact that it will aid your child's emotional health, their developmental health. You know that this is a good thing for both of you, which then allows you to be consistent. You cannot request of yourself to be consistent with anything if you don't have certainty that it's the right thing for your child because your brain will not allow you to do that because it's your child and it's way too important. And unless it is customized to your child, you're not going to feel certain. So if you've ever found that you're not consistent with things, that's why. It's normal. It's a biological response where your brain is like, hold on, we are not sure about this. We are not 100% sure. This is our child. This is literally a part of our heart outside of our bodies. We are not going to like test something on them right? And that is why. It's not because you're inconsistent. It's because your brain is trying to tell you, mm -mm. no, 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 no. We need to make sure, right? Worst thing to be told is to be told to wait it out and that you'd miss the sleepless night. The, did you tell that person to go F themselves? Nobody misses sleepless night. You'll miss the cuddles of a newborn. Absolutely. Nobody misses sleepless nights. Because here's the thing. The first five years of your kid's life are arguably the most amazing years. They grow so much. You watch them go from a tiny baby who learns how to smile the first time to making made up games that are like, a super fantastic, like my kids earlier, they were taking my um, kitchen chairs and building an airplane. You know, you see them go from tiny, tiny to like learning languages. It's, it's, I'm not saying to the teenage years won't be cool. I'm not there yet, but the first five years are, they're amazing. If you're exhausted and overwhelmed, you're not going to remember them. You're not going to remember them. Because you were exhausted and overwhelmed and you kept putting your phone in the freezer. So how can you remember? You also didn't enjoy them because every part of your body and brain hurt. And you and your spouse were fighting because you were exhausted. You're allowed to enjoy those years. And to enjoy those years, your child needs to be healthy and he needs to sleep to do that. And you need to be healthy, right? Uh, Kaiza says, so does this mean before nine months, object permanence, they don't feel abandoned when you leave them at night? So before nine months, they can actually cry if you leave the room, but it doesn't have to do with the concept of feeling like you're abandoning them. It usually has to do more with 
they are accustomed to falling asleep on you in your arms cocooned in a particular way or while breastfeeding you are as you should be right until a certain point an assistive device to them relaxing their body calming their mind in order to fall asleep and they can cry if you leave the room because they still want to be in your arms not because they feel that you're abandoning them because in their head you can't at four months abandon them they're not fearful that you've disappeared it's just that they want to be in your arms it's comfortable or at around six seven months fomo intense fear of missing out for a lot of babies you'll see them at around six seven months they used to breastfeed to sleep just fine and all of a sudden they're like taking three sips and they're like looking around them, taking three sips and then looking around them. They have total FOMO, right? And that can be associated. So you're still going to see babies who cry when you leave the room. And still, it's not something you want to ignore, but it's just a different reason. They don't have the concept that you're disappearing. But suddenly at nine months, it's like you're gone. You close the door, you, you've disappeared, right? Before nine months, a lot of parents, you know, um, are able to go pee. Or if the baby cries, it's because they put them down and they just want to be physically close, but they don't think you've actually abandoned them. Um, when my son is crying, I feel like he looks like an angry potato. <laughs> Tiny potato inventors. Exactly. So the point is, these things compound, these things add up, and you end up with a really complicated mix of things. So if you're going through the seminar and you're like, darn, like there's a lot of things going on. I have a minestrone soup, you know, and, and this can happen at three months. There can be, your baby had reflux and colics and like a lot of things happened and you're like, okay, well, how do I fix this? It's okay to ask for help. Well, somebody will drop our calendar link, just book a call and come talk to us about sleep consulting. We have something for pretty much every single budget, right? That's what we're there for. And I've always found it very ridiculous that, you know, we'll pay a monthly fee for a cell phone. We'll pay a monthly fee for a Netflix subscription. We will pay ridiculous amounts of money for a vehicle. We will, you know, spend money on clothing. We will spend money on building a new deck. We'll spend money on our husband's hunting trip, but then our child and we as a parent needs health assistance. And we're like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to spend money on that. Shouldn't the first place you invest be your family? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? The, like, this is the number one priority. The debt does not matter. The car does not matter. The Netflix does not matter if your child is not getting sleep, which is a basic human need. If you are not getting sleep and that it is causing you physical, mental, emotional, and marital issues, it matters. Cut other things out to work with a nutritionist if your child has a nutritional problem. Cut other things out to work with a sleep consultant if your child has sleeping issues. Cut other things out so that your child can work with a speech language therapist if your child has a language delay. Cut other things out if you are struggling with anxiety or depression and you need to see a therapist. It, th th these things should be priority, but we kind of have it screwed it up right now. I've had families where baby and mom are brutally exhausted, like they're barely surviving. And they're like, oh, we can't afford to spend any money on uh, a sleep consultant because we want to repaint the deck. And I'm like, eh. we have programs that start as low as $750 for six months of support. And we have payment plans for that. And we provide you HSA resorts, uh, receipts, resorts, HSA resorts, HSA receipts. We have payment plans on those and they're tax deductible. And it goes all the way into like nine grand for our most famous 
amazing life transforming program but even then you can get it for 160 dollars a month right and there's everything in between there's something for everyone the main factor is where are you putting your priorities right if you have a sleep problem get sleep help stop banging your head against the wall it's unnecessary and the truth of the matter is, if even if you put your kid in the best private school in the world and you feed them the best vegetables in the world and you give the best kisses in the world, if your child is missing sleep, he can't learn. His brain will be underdeveloped. He's going to have health issues. It matters. Okay. And also you matter. As I just said, so if a baby learned the skill to fall asleep on their own before nine months, Will these skills transfer through the nine months or can they still freak out? So yes, learning how to fall asleep physiologically on their own, like knowing how to relax their body and calm their minds and go to sleep can be transferred. Absolutely. Now it is possible that at nine months, they will suddenly have an upset when you're putting them to bed because they're having that social anxiety. But what we do is we do exercises during the day leading up to that to teach them that even though you're not visually present, you're still there. And so it doesn't tend to happen. Or if it happens, it's like one or two odd wake ups due to the learning, the development, the new neural networks in the deep sleep, but they're able to fall back asleep. Right. But if your child has not learned how to even physically fall asleep on their own, and they have multiple wake-ups already, then those wake-ups can kind of become worse at that point due to the social anxiety, okay? Um, how long does a sleep routine need to be followed continuously before babies can learn to stick to it? So it takes about a week for a sleep routine before bedtime to start signaling physically to the body that it's time to sleep. Now, a sleep routine, remember, on its own is not going to fix a sleep problem, but it'll signal to the brain that it's time to go to sleep. When should you start a sleep routine? At what age should we be starting a sleep routine? Do you think? Like, at what age does it matter? You can start with your toddler, absolutely, but it's not going to fix the sleep problem on its own. Um, newborn. So at six weeks, at six weeks, you need to be starting a routine. Why? At that age, they are particularly in a danger zone of uh, mixing day and night or having day and night confusion. So the reason we start sleep routines at six weeks at least or earlier it's just a little bit harder to do earlier but we started at six weeks to prevent a day and night confusion okay we had uh, a client who uh at nine months her baby still had a day and night confusion in other words mom was not sleeping at all because she had a toddler and when her baby would actually sleep during the day she could not sleep so she was not sleeping at all she was like a shell of who she was at that point and it had been going on for nine months I think it took us a week and we fixed our sleep problem, but it started at around six weeks, okay? Every living organism all the way down to bacteria have what we call circadian rhythms, which are um, rhythms physiologically that control when you sleep versus when you are awake, okay? Everything sleeps. Everything that has life sleeps. And our circadian rhythm changes as we edge through different developmental stages. So you might remember, right, that when you were a teenager, you probably went to bed a little bit later and you woke up later. Elderly people tend to go to bed a little bit earlier and they wake up earlier. Babies tend to follow similarly to a, a elders and they will go to sleep a little bit earlier and oftentimes will wake up earlier. And um, the as adults, we kind of like are in the middle zone of that, right? The problem we have as a society is we now think that the normal circadian rhythm is that of a 30 year old, but it is normal for a 16 year old to have a different circadian rhythm. Why? 
deep sleep versus lighter sleep serves two different purposes in the brain, okay? Deep sleep serves at building neural networks versus lighter sleep serves at pruning or perfecting or perfectioning, my French is coming out, uh, perfecting those neural networks. Now, as a teenager, they do a lot more perfecting of neural networks and making additional connections versus building new neural networks compared to a baby or a young child that does a lot of building. And so it is normal and expected and also due to hormonal reasons and what have you for a teenager to have a circadian rhythm that gets pushed a little bit. And so they will naturally go to bed a little bit later and wake up a little bit later. So teenagers don't wake up late because they're lazy. They wake up because late because that's what their body needs. It's what their brain needs. But we tell them they're lazy because we've decided that the 30-year-old, you know, sleep cycle or circadian rhythm is normal. Elderly people, if they try and follow our circadian rhythm, they struggle. It's very difficult, right? Um, people who try and force their babies to go to bed at like 10 p.m. and wake up at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning. Look, some babies can wake up at that time. Most cannot. They need to go to bed earlier than you, okay? Like, do I go to fireworks every once in a while and they'll go to bed late? Absolutely. But on an average, my kids go to bed early because that's what their brain needs. I love to travel. I, you know, do a lot of activities with my kids. We go out to the restaurant. We go out to activities. We get compliments all the time because they're so well behaved. But you will never, ever hear me say arguably one of the most stupidest sentences I have ever heard. When I have kids, they're going to adjust to my schedule, not the other way around. Honey, if you still think that is the truth, you are in for a surprise, which we at B Baby call the 18-wheeler reality check, where it feels like an 18-wheeler has smacked you in the face and you suddenly wake up. It's not going to happen, okay? You, as a parent who decided to have a human child, are now devoting the next 25 years to raising said child. You need to protect your self-care. You need to protect your marriage. You need to protect yourself. But... You also need to adjust to the fact that you have a child and he's running the show, okay? When it comes to deciding when they go to bed and how many naps they need, et cetera, they are running the show. Their biological needs are running the show and you need to adapt to it. Now, we, Happy Baby, have developed many ways for you to be all that you want to be and to live the life that you want to be within deep, utter respect of your child's needs. You cannot keep your baby up until two in the morning. It's irresponsible. It is bad for them. Don't have kids if that's what you think having kids is. If you think it comes with no sacrifice and not going to a bar is too much of a sacrifice for you, don't have kids. Okay? We parents, we do barbecues. Okay? That's what we do. We do asado instead of going out to bars, okay? Adjust, adjust. We still travel, we still see friends, we still go do activities, we do all kinds of great things, but we have respect for our children's biological needs. Now, if you're here, chances are you have that respect, right? You deserve to receive the education, the training, the assistance, the guidance, so that you can make the most out of these years with your children, shouldn't you? I think that you deserve that. So that you can build a life that you absolutely love, build memories that will last a lifetime while you are healthy and happy and your babies are healthy and happy and everybody is, you know, thriving versus simply surviving. Um, Yes, your kids would be cranky without a schedule. They, they need a little something. Now, the thing is, if you have a schedule and a routine as a blueprint and you go to an activity and you veer completely off, your kids are going to freak out because they're generally more calm because they have that, you know, stability in their lives, right? And 
you'll always have the relative who tells you, just put him to bed later, he'll sleep in. No, that, that's, that's not how it works. If you put your bed, your baby to bed later, um, he will wake up earlier and you will have a bad day the next day. Now, here's the thing. When I put my kids to bed late, I understand and know there is a strong possibility they'll wake up early the next day and that they will be cranky the next day. And I am judging and evaluating the risk and the price. And I am making an informed decision that I am ready to let them, you know, stay up late and to pay the price the next day because it's worth it, right? I, as the parent who will be up earlier and making that decision, the grandparents don't get to make that decision for me because they're not going to be the ones dealing with the tantrums the next day. So I make an informed decision in regards to if this is a pro and con that is winning on the pro side or on the con side, right? Um, especially when they go to bed late. Exactly. They're going to be like, you put me to bed late. You need sleep. You had a little bit too much wine to drink. I'm going to be up at five. See you then, right? And it's going to be Paw Patrol and toes. And I'm not going to be patient. I'm not going to wait an hour for you to give me breakfast while you have coffee. I'm going to want it now, right? It's going to be a completely different type of day. So those are consequences you have to willfully choose in an informed fashion and organize the next day so that it actually works for you, right? And that is why we as parents invest in fancy coffee machines. Hallelujah. Exactly. The most expensive thing in my house is my coffee machine. Absolutely. And that is why at Bee Baby, when you join, shameless plug, okay? When you join the Peace of Mind Parenting Program, or even in our circle during the seminar, ding, 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 we will send you free of charge a self-heating coffee mug so that you can drink your coffee warm all the time, okay? So it is really, which machine? I will, I will post a picture. Uh, I don't remember the name by heart, but it, like, I'm ashamed. Well, I'm not ashamed at how much money I paid for it, but you know, it's a good machine. It's like the most expensive thing I own. And I'm in love with it. I, I, I have no regrets. It's, it's me and her. We're friends. We've supported each other in hard times and good times. And, okay. So if you haven't booked a call yet and you would like to discuss the possibility of, I don't know, getting help because you deserve help, go ahead and book a call. Book a call when your spouse can, you know, join you on a lunch break or whatever it might be. We have availability on Saturday, exceptionally this week due to the sleep seminar. Um, here's my thing when it comes to your spouses being present. If they want to have a say, then they have to sit down, right? Okay. If they want to have a say in the decision, then they actually have to show up to the meeting. If they don't want to show up to the meeting, then you have veto and they have to hand over the credit card so that you can make the decision on which program you judge is the best one because you're the one who's participating in the call. That's how my marriage works anyways. If I don't want to sit down through something, he's making the decision, right? Um, if I want to have something to say about it, then I show up. But at the same time, there are just things that he has a veto over and I have a veto over. It's just the, the way that it is, right? Uh, because we're a team. So go ahead and book a call if you haven't yet booked a call to work with a sleep consultant because it's just, it's unnecessary for you guys to struggle this much with sleep. Like if, if sleep problems and you might feel like, oh, I'm the only one, you know, why does my friend not need a sleep consultant? First of all, a lot of the people you know have hired sleep consultants. They're just not saying so on social media. You should say so on social media. You should make other moms aware that it's okay to seek help. If we talked about it more, more people would know. Second of all, it's absolutely normal to need help. And it is not because somebody else has struggled for 18 years that you need to, right? Uh, my grandmother, you know, as I said, always laughs that, you know, we have washing machines today, but back in the day she had to, uh, 
wash clothes in the river and she once had to run after a chicken and wring its neck to make dinner. Uh, does that mean you can't go buy food at the grocery store? No. You know, we try and simplify things from generation to generation. And especially when it comes to our babies and our children, we try and do better. You know, my grandma jokes and she said, you know, back in my day, the expectations of, of, of us as moms was to keep 75% of our kids alive. That really was it, right? The expectations on moms and dads today are significantly different, right? We are expected to raise good people that are going to be, you know, good members of society to optimize their physical health, to optimize their opportunities in life, right? Because we live in a world where, you know, it's getting harder and harder to, you know, make your place. We have to raise them to be emotionally intelligent, which is a big thing now, right? How are you going to be emotionally intelligent when you are cranky as hell? Because you can't sleep. I can't be emotionally intelligent when I'm sleep deprived or angry. Are you kidding me? No. And I wouldn't expect my child to be either, right? They're perfectly excused to be unreasonable on a day where they went to bed late the night before. They're sleep, they, they, they haven't had enough sleep. They can nap whenever they want. I will offer them bubble baths. They're, you know, they're having a rough day. It is what it is, right? I'm back in Vietnam, X, Y, Z. Exactly. We are not in Vietnam and we are in 2024. My grandmother always jokes that she hates when she hears people say that because she's like, do you know how many moms around me were popping Xanax, you know, in the early 50s? She's like, they were all popping Xanax. So they appeared happy on the outside, but they were, a lot of them were miserable because they were exhausted. Also, there was no social media, so they couldn't share how difficult it was. They couldn't, you know, offer each other support. It's different now. Let's do better. Let's raise more emotionally intelligent children. Let's raise children who have good relationships with their parents where there's mutual respect you respect their needs and they respect you as a parent, right? They're well raised. Um, I almost find it sad because I go to the restaurant and I go out to activities really often with my five kids. And like I said, they're six and under, right? Usually when you walk into a public place, especially a restaurant with six kids, with five kids, sorry, people get a little nervous, right? And usually what ends up happening is people at tables around us come and they say, they congratulate us or they tell us, oh my God, I've never seen children so well behaved, et cetera, et cetera. And I find it almost sad because it's the peace of mind parenting approach. It's what we teach. It's how to parent in an emotionally healthy way, but that also teaches proper boundaries. It's respecting their sleep needs and making it an importance. It's respecting their nutritional needs and making it important. No, you cannot just eat you know, chicken nuggets, even though that's all you want to eat. No, we have to make sure you're eating healthy. It is the whole peace of mind parenting program that is geared around that, that not only allows them to be happy, healthy, you know, young little people that makes them also incredibly smart, but it also as a parent means that I can take five kids on a trip. I can take five kids on an airplane. I can take five kids to the restaurant. I can take five kids to, you know, go to the grocery store, et cetera, and have a good experience, right? Because we at the in at Be Baby, we professionalize parenthood in a sense, right? It is the most challenging yet the most important thing you will ever do in your life. So you should have guidance. You should have information. You know, you shouldn't be winging it. No, it's your child. You know, you get to have systems for cooking and cleaning and running errands so that it takes less time so that you can invest more time in the things that matter, right? You should know what to do when your child is struggling with sleep or breastfeeding or having tantrums or their gastrointestinal health, all the things that we do because it's important and it matters and it's your job. And it's what your heart is asking you to do, right? Um, like the relatives that feed high energy kids sugary treats and wonder why she's so hyper. Um, and then wonder why I don't ask them to babysit. 
<laughs> because then they can't go to bed afterwards. Exactly. Right. And I'm the first one to make, you know, hot chocolate for my kids and we'll have an occasional, you know, treat night and that sort of thing. Um, but the thing is the rest of my, the time my kids eat healthy, right? They sleep well. Uh, we educate them at home a lot, right? My kids know two learning three languages. My six-year-old can count to a hundred. He can do additions and subtractions. Is it because he's smarter than everybody else? Every parent thinks that their kids are smarter. No, it's just because he's sleeping well. He's well nourished and we've been able to spend time to teach him those things. And his brain is responsive because he's not exhausted. Yesterday for dinner, they had a nice salad and we had different types of cheeses. We had baked brie and we had, you know, a nice little bread with that. And they sat down and we had a nice long dinner while chit chatting about different things and eating salad. Right. And the thing is, it all starts with sleep. Sleep is kind of like that foundation. If your kid is sleep deprived, they won't have the appetite for food because their stomachs are upset. They won't have the patience, the desire, the concentration or ability to learn complex concepts because they're exhausted. They won't be able to practice emotional health because hello, they're exhausted and they just want to eat your face off, right? It's totally normal, okay? So your homework of today is actually to A, make sure you're there tomorrow because tomorrow is arguably the most important session because we're talking about health and sleep. So we're talking about all the non-sleep related sleep disruptors, mm -hmm, right? So it is a very, 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 very incredibly important session and somebody's winning the scholarship. So I want you to post inside of the Be Baby Family Group as a homework why you should be part of one of our Be Baby programs. Why are you the type of parent that should be and one of those programs. I want you to sell yourself, right? And sell us on why you should have a spot within the program, right? Why are you the right type of parent to be inside of our program? Because it's not for everybody. If you don't care and you think that parenting is just, we should just wing it and the flow and da 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 da, da it's probably not for you because it's very organized. There's a lot of data, there's a lot of information. We have specific plans. Uh, it's not for you. If you're type A, we are we are your people. <laughs> if you want to be more organized and more structured and the lack of is making you nervous or uncomfortable, we're your safe place. If you think that when it comes to parenting, it should be like cooking spaghetti, you should throw it on the wall and hope that it sticks, we're not your people, right? If you're tired of going into sleep groups posting that you're having a sleep problem and getting a whole bunch of advice from other sleep deprived parents who clearly don't have the answer because they're in the group because their babies aren't sleeping, but they're telling you how to make your baby sleep. If you're tired of that, we're your people. Okay. So go post inside of the group why you should be within a B-Baby program. Like what are your needs and what type of person are you and why is this important, right? Why sh should this be something that you should consider, right? Because we obviously want someone um, to win the scholarship that, you know, wants to be there so that you actually, you know, take advantage of it fully and book a call at the end if you're looking at it and you're like yeah yeah that i should be book a call if you're trying to write up the answer and you're like no i believe that children should go to bed at 2 a.m and that they should adapt to my schedule don't book a call don't book a call okay it's okay it's not for everybody that's okay but just you know we can't help you because if you're putting your kid down at three in the morning, I can just guarantee you, you're going to have sleep problems. It's just, you know, the way that it is. And I will see you again tomorrow at noon. And we're going to be diving deep, deep into everything 
from reflux colics, constipation, nightmares, night terrors, anxiety, separation anxiety, tummy aches, and all of those teething problems and all the things that you feel or know can impact your child's sleep. And what do you do about it? Does that mean you can't sleep educate as long as they're teething? Does that mean you can't sleep educate because they're sick? Well, if your kid goes to daycare, that's a two-year span. So no, we're going to need an alternative. So that is exactly what we're going to be doing. Have a great day.